As you probably know, 2018 is the year of the reef. And it's great that the marine environment is getting a lot more publicity these days. Um, but I think it's never been more important uh, to focus on the reef and the marine environment around it, whether it's focusing on plastics or fisheries, and I'm not going to talk a lot more about that because there are people down here who are far better able than me. Um, but it is hugely important, and for us at FFI, it's something that we've been focused on for a while. We started a marine program in 2010, and I'm delighted by the breadth and the impact of that. And this evening, you're going to hear about how we've taken the core of the way FFI does business into the marine environment, really working with and focusing on the role of local communities to be effective. And to talk about that in detail, our three speakers um, are colleagues and partners from around the world. Uh, we've got Marianne Teo from Cambodia, Lorna Slade from Pemba Island in Tanzania, and Kerry Whiteside from closer to home in Scotland. Um, but before we uh, listen to them, I'm delighted that we've got Hugh Fernley Whittingstall with us. He needs very little introduction. He's done such a fantastic job of raising awareness of all the issues in the marine environment. A wonderful broadcaster, pretty good cook, I gather. Um, and he's also, uh, we're delighted to say, a vice president of FFI, which is really great. And so without further ado, Hugh, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's, it's an honor to stand here and, and talk about marine reserves. I'm not going to do it for very long because we're going to bring on the real experts very shortly. But I, I do want to say that um, of all the things that, that uh, get me excited and get me motivated to campaign around the area of the health of our oceans, I, I don't think there's anything more important than, than marine reserves. I mean, if we don't have areas of our oceans that are really set aside from the very, very heavy use and, and ridiculous overfishing, then we're going to be in terrible trouble. Now, it's very easy to say that, but there's been a couple of occasions uh, in my life when I've seen things that so startled me that they really kind of etched on my mind forever, really, just how important this issue is. Um, one of them was actually the sheer difficulty when we were filming uh, the second series of, of Hughes Fish Fight for Channel 4, we, were, we wanted to film what the seabed might look like if it wasn't repeatedly dragged and dredged and pulled around by heavy bottom gear for scallops and beam trawling and that kind of thing. And it was really, really hard to find anywhere around the UK where you could say that is pristine seafloor, that hasn't been messed around with. It's, it's a, a fraction of a percentage of our, of our inshore coastal waters that are fully, fully protected. Um, and I know that Kerry's going to tell us about some of the uh, exciting projects that are happening in Scotland that give hope that before too long there may be more. I ev eventually ended up diving in a place called Port Erin in the Isle of Man. And I went uh, on that dive with Professor Callum Roberts, who many of you uh, will know and others of you will have read. Fantastic guy. And incidentally, if you missed his um, Life Scientific on, on Radio 4 a couple of weeks back, um, fantastic, uh, well worth listening to. Not least because in just 25 minutes of, of pithy radio and extremely well-argued science, he beautifully makes the case for marine reserves. Um, but I went diving with Callum and Port Erin, and the idea was to, to dive um, this small patch of, of ground that had not been, that essentially had, had been untouched for, for 30 years at least. Um, and it was a popular dive site on the Isle of Man. 
And then we were going to dive very close to it, a piece of ground that was reg regularly fished for scallops. And we did the, um, we, we did the Port Erin, the, the, the nice dive, if you like, first. And actually, the visibility was quite poor. And we were filming, so that was a little bit concerning because we really wanted these very striking images of, of what, what an unspoilt seafloor looks like. And um, so in order to be able to see much, uh, we had to get fairly close to the bottom. And, and I mean, actually, I always have a thing when I'm on a dive when the visibility isn't great or there's not sort of loads of lovely megafauna sharks or seals swimming around. Just go macro, go tight, go to the bottom and have a close look. And what I saw on the floor, on the sea floor there, was something I'd never really seen before in the UK waters. Because as you got closer, you saw, a, saw that it, there was quite a lot of stuff going on. There was some soft corals, some seaweeds, some brittle stars that you could start to see from three or four feet away. As you were a little bit closer, you could see in the gaps between them, there were things moving too. And when eventually I found myself looking with my face just about six or eight inches above the sea floor, I realized that actually the entire seafloor was teeming. It was moving. There was stuff going on. There was life. The bent thick fauna and flora on the bottom of that sea was, you, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't put a finger on anything that wasn't alive. And that actually is the benchmark of healthy seafloors. Not, not, obviously, not everywhere, not in every environment, but in many, many coastal environments. Of course, it's what you expect on a coral reef. Everywhere is occupied. Not necessarily what you expect on a patch of... Uh, admittedly, this is quite sheltered ground. But actually, that's what huge swathes of our inshore coastal waters should be like. And it's what they would be like if we didn't treat them so harshly and drag them so often. That was very, very exciting... Unfortunately, the, the sad bit came afterwards when Callum and I, uh, we took a breather and got back in the water barely 100 metres away from where we'd been, outside the reserve, where the scallop dredgers had been pounding up and down regularly for years, kept coming back. It was a desert. I mean, it was just sand, a few stones, the odd empty scallop shell, it's still a productive and profitable fishery for scallops, for a monoculture of scallops. A, 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 I don't like to say this to the scallop because the scallop, of course, is innocent, but it, there's a sense in which it's, it's the mopper upper, it's the, it, it's the cockroach uh, of the seabed. If there's any small benthic nutrition left, the scallop can forage on it and do all right. So it actually perpetuates the myth because money can be made gathering in these scallops, dredging in these scallops, it perpetuates the idea that this is somehow still productive sea. It isn't. It's barren of everything but bloody scallops. <laughs> um, so that was, that was in, in, extremely striking. Um, but, the other, but the other places I've seen around, uh, uh, around the world also give hope, because one thing we know about the ocean is it has extraordinary powers of self-restoration. You know, as long as... I mean, that, that ex extraordinary... I mean, I sometimes think of the ocean as extraordinary, but it somehow knows itself from one side to the other. Everything flows this way and that. And in every piece of... In, 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 hidden in, in, in these sort of vast movements of the ocean are the seeds of recovery that know when they can drop in and land and make a living again. They're always looking for that opportunity. And all we really need to do to allow that to happen is leave some decent patches of the sea alone for very long periods of time. And when we were filming for the same series in the Philippines, we went to a tiny marine reserve that was actually so small it was marked off the shore with... Uh, a line looked like a sort of swimming pool lane. It had a line, a floating line with a few boys on it, marking off. It probably wasn't much bigger than two or three times the size of this room going into a beach. Because it was marked off, everybody knew that it was there. And it had only been protected for seven or eight years. 
but get, and it had a, 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 a one tiny little miniature wreck in it, and it had quite a lot of rocks. And it was absolutely teeming with fish. But one thing that was really nice to see was that the, the local fishermen, who actually were quite a scary crowd when they first appeared, they, 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 they arrived paddling on a, on, a, on a long kind of pirogue, and they were dressed in the most extraordinary way. They looked like they were about to take part in a kind of zombie video because they had torn T-shirts wrapped around their faces and uh, because they were going to spend the whole day out at sea. They were essentially protecting themselves from the sun. So they had ski masks or socks or balaclavas that were the things they'd cut holes in, old T-shirts they'd tied knots in. Um, but they were a fantastically friendly bunch and they invited me to fish with them. And... What they did was productive, and it was respectful of the marine reserve. They put in some shortish nets, which hang from, hung from floats with weights so that they hung just above the seabed. They laid them out, and then they drove their pirogue around and got in the water, and they literally splashed and made a racket, and they pushed fish uh, in towards their nets. And, of course, what, one of, essentially what they were doing is they were they were fishing the spillover from the marine reserve and pushing some of that into the nets. And, of course, pushing some of it back into the marine reserve. Uh, but this marine reserve, when we talked to them about it with translators, they said that this marine reserve had been a godsend, that they were uh, catching almost nothing and, until it was designated. And they were highly sceptical when it first came, and now they were its biggest champions. And they, they could see not just that it wasn't just there as a sort of keep out sign, a keep off, you know, leave this alone, this is not for you. It was there as a productive base, as a, as, as a beating heart uh, of the local ecology that would pump out plenty of small fish and growing fish and uh, squid eggs and all sorts of things into the surrounding seas that it would be a producer for them. And, of course, this is how we need to think of marine reserves, not just as a big keep-out sign. And this is how we have to do this difficult outreach work within the fishing communities, local and big-scale stuff as well, uh, because this conversation is hard. I've, I've been in so many rooms where the so-called conservationists on one side and the fishermen on the other. And actually, the fishermen so often forget that some of us conservationists really like eating fish. You know, it's really right up there among our favourite foods. And we're just as keen to see the sea, if, you know, full of fish as they are. So uh, for me, one of the things that we need to achieve in the coming years is to this meeting of the minds, this, this idea that actually we're all in this conversation for the same thing. We all want to see increases in our fish stocks, a more vibrant and healthy marine environment. This is what we're fighting for. And this is what the amazing people who you're going to hear from today are working at day in, day out. And I was lucky enough to, to be with the FFI at the summer event last year, uh, celebrating the Whitley Award winner, Zafir Kazilkaya, who some of you, if you were there, will remember. He'd done amazingly inspiring work in Turkey, in the Mediterranean, another bit of the sea that's really struggling or has, has struggled so much uh, down the years. And yet he was successfully bringing back sandbar sharks and Mediterranean monk seals, this charismatic megafauna of the region, giving local people hope and, in many cases, young people an understanding for the first time that these creatures even existed or had the potential to exist on their doorstep. Anyway, that's enough uh, from me and now let's get to the science and the inspiring work being done in this area by uh, Flora and Fauna International, uh, our hosts who I'm very privileged uh, to say uh, to be a part of now. Thank you for having me here this evening and who are we going to hear from now? We're going to hear from Nicola who's going to give us a little bit more perspective on the overall work of, of FFI in this incredibly important area. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Hugh. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, I'd like to just ask, how many people here watched the recent series of The Blue Planet? 
Can I get a show of hands? Well, <laughs> okay, an overwhelming number. So that means I probably don't need to work too hard to make the case for why the oceans are important and why they need to be protected. But I would like to start things off by reminding us of that this evening and also talking about some of the perspectives, uh, talking about some of the uh, approaches that we choose to use as an organisation to tackle some of the issues facing the ocean. Okay, so there's an awe-inspiring world beneath the ocean waves. From its warm coastal waters through to its dark depths, the ocean hosts a stunning array of marine ecosystems. It offers a vast living space for marine life, from the smallest plankton through to the roaming ocean giants like the blue whale. And there's over a quarter of a million species that are known to call the ocean home, but as the Blue Planet showed, we're discovering new things about the ocean and the creatures that live within it all the time. One thing that does seem to be increasingly well understood is that marine life and people alike need the ocean to stay healthy. We draw a huge range of benefits from the ocean, from food, medicines, uh, coastal protection, the way it regulates our climate. Uh, and there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that there are benefits for our emotional and physical well-being that come from spending time by the ocean. But a degraded ocean can't provide those benefits in the same way. And sadly, marine ecosystems around the world are degraded and are in decline. Local pressures like overfishing, uh, coastal development, pollution, and mounting. And these combine with the changes that are happening to ecosystems as a result of climate change to push species to the edge of their tolerance. Without concerted action, we're facing the prospect that uh, coral reefs could be lost within the next 30 years. That's the loss of an entire global ecosystem that underpins a quarter of known marine life. So this really is a critical time for the ocean. <coughs> to help the ocean get back on track, as Hugh said, we need to be setting aside areas where mankind's activities are restricted and regulated in a way that gives species and habitats the chance to recover and reproduce. And this is essentially what marine protected areas do. Now, marine protected areas on their own can't solve all the problems for the troubled ocean, uh, so they have to be used as part of a wider set of measures that are, for example, reducing pollution or reducing our carbon emissions. But a well-managed MPA can deliver benefits for biodiversity and it can help to recover local fisheries. So it creates benefits for nature and people that flow beyond its boundaries. And when you think of marine protected areas, you might imagine these covering vast areas of the open ocean. Uh, and indeed, there's been an increasing number of large-scale MPAs um, making the headlines in recent years as countries compete with each other to set up the world's largest MPAs that are off-limit to fishing. Setting up MPAs in remote areas where very few people live and are likely to be directly impacted is proving to be politically feasible and therefore a favoured option. Setting MPAs up in our crowded coasts and estuaries where people uh, are heavily reliant on their catches for income and food is considerably more challenging. And it's along these highly biodiverse coastlines where people and biodiversity are in the closest contact and where the, the threats posed by the full range of our activities, as we see here, uh, have a, you know, a very high impact. So for FFI, increasing the protection of these critically important ecosystems is, is a priority. But it's not just about setting up marine protected areas. We, mean, we need to make sure that these work. And this comes down to a combination of good design, securing high levels of support, and also good enforcement. Um, and without these factors in place, MPAs exist merely as lines on a map, giving the illusion of conservation, but changing very little in the water. Uh, and these so-called paper parks are surprisingly common. This image actually shows a patrol team returning illegal species, an illegally fished species back to the water, in case you're wondering what's there. <laughs> and to give MPAs the best chance of success in a coastal area, we need creative solutions that balance the conservation uh, objectives and ambitions with an understanding about how people use and rely on the resources. Importantly, people need uh, to understand the benefits that an MPA can bring to their local area and be consulted in its development to make it more likely that they can engage with it in a positive way. And where that's not done well, we see MPAs receiving very low levels of support and marine ecosystems continuing to decline. 
So it's with this in mind that FFI works hand in hand with local people to help them establish locally managed marine areas. And this is a proven model that puts communities at the heart of the conservation effort and allows them to engage in decisions about how to improve the resources that they rely on. And importantly, the communities then go on to play a role in ensuring that these sites are actually um, run effectively and that the rules and regulations are actively enforced. And across our global programme, we support this kind of locally-led conservation effort across 12 different country contexts from places as diverse as Myanmar to Costa Rica. And as we're going to hear from subsequent presentations, we're seeing really positive results from this work, which includes much greater levels of support for marine conservation, greater levels of compliance with the rules, and also more rapid improvements for biodiversity. Success in one area quickly leads to appetite from neighbouring communities to follow suit, to do similar action. And this slide shows the red lines are areas that have been identified by communities for protection. And by joining the dot, this dots, this local action offers a really meaningful way to actually increase the effectiveness of protection in coastal areas. But importantly, it doesn't stop there. These mobilised and empowered communities can then go on to play a really important role in driving the wider changes that are needed in the areas beyond these sites. So they become champions to advocate for changes in policy and practice as they relate to illegal fishing or coastal development or pollution um, to ensure that the gains that they're actually making locally can persist. And we're really lucky tonight to have our colleagues here from Cambodia, Tanzania and Scotland who are supporting this really important work on the ground um, and who are going to share their experiences with us. And so I would like to hand over now to Marion Tio, who's uh, the project manager for FFI's growing programme of marine work in Cambodia. And Marion actually normally lives in Cambodia, so we're really lucky that she's been able to join us this evening. So please welcome her to the stage. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for coming here today. I'm very excited to be here. I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey about my experience in Cambodia, why I work somewhere on the other side of the world, and what I've learned from the people and the places that I've worked with and in. So what I'd like to do is start my journey in the place where I began, in the village of Preksvai in Korong in Cambodia. This community is based on a set of islands just off the coastline in Cambodia, which I care deeply about. And I began my journey as a fresh-faced and very enthusiastic marine scientist, ready to save the world using science. And um, I was there to monitor marine habitats, to feed into the development of a marine protected area in Cambodia. So why is this place so special? Why, why are we working in this site in Cambodia? So if you go down that river in that village, you come out into incredible dense mangrove habitat. Go further along that river and you emerge out into pristine coastline, stunning beaches and fringing seagrass beds that are nurseries to all of marine life. A little bit deeper out into the water, Beautiful coral reefs. I definitely don't need to sell these habitats. They speak for themselves. But in Cambodia, we're seeing a really intriguing and surprising resilience. And these habitats, they support amazing species. I will talk about the small critters, because that's my personal passion. But we have the seahorse. This is iconic to Cambodia and brings divers and researchers around the world to Cambodia. We have the colorful nudibranch critically endangered sea turtles, and my personal favorite, the shy and cryptic octopus. <laughs> so all of these habitats and these amazing animals in the ocean support an ecosystem that fundamentally provides a source of food and income to communities and families across Cambodia's coastline. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today. So Cambodia is a country that has undergone dramatic change. Having recently endured a brutal regime, 
in its recent history, it has emerged as an exciting and rapidly developing country, which has one of the fastest growing economies and a rapidly developing and growing population, faster than all of its neighbors. And fish. Fish is the major source of protein in Cambodia, with over three quarters of all animal protein consumed being from fish and seafood. So with a unfortunate fisheries collapse under, underway in Cambodia and this reliance on this fish protein and an ever-growing population, there's immense pressure on these resources. And it's not just the coral reefs and the seagrasses that are in decline because of this. Even the crabs, as you can see here, the crabs and the fish, fishermen are reporting in Cambodia that these are getting much smaller and people are able to fish and catch less than they did in previous generations. The coral reefs are being damaged through the removal of predators. Seagrasses are being trawled. And unfortunately, the sea turtles, we see them more often than not caught in fishing nets rather than free swimming or on nesting on beaches. And of course, with each rising tide, we get fresh waves of plastics coming up onto these once pristine beaches. So how do we protect the life that remains? And can we restore these systems? How can we do this while meeting the needs and desires of a burgeoning coastal population in Cambodia? So that's what why FFI started. In 2012, the Cambodian government invited FFI to tackle these questions and work with the government and the communities to figure out how we can protect the environment. So what we did, what FFI did, with partners across the key areas in Cambodia was work to actually set up Cambodia's first marine protected area. This was a very exciting achievement, a landmark achievement in Cambodia, and it's something we're immensely proud about. This is the marine protected area. This is Cambodia's coastline, and you can see the marine protected area and its zones clearly on the left-hand side. So this incredible achievement um, reflects a lot of MPAs that are being developed around the world. And as a conservation scientist, I knew the process. You do the research, you consult with stakeholders, you create and adapt maps and management plans, you get a governance structure underway, enforcement, policy, you effect change, and you get an MPA. However, how do you actually make that MPA successful? The key to making this MPA meaningful and successful lies with the communities that work here and live here. In each of these communities, there are five communities across the, coast, across the Korong Archipelago MPA. In each of these communities, teams of local representatives are elected, and these are the teams that manage their fishing grounds. These teams are known as community fisheries. Um, and on the right is, uh, with the amazing trousers, is Nick, who I had the pleasure of getting to know while I lived in this village. Um, she is actually the first elected female community fishery member, as well as the first woman to be part of patrols around the MPA. She's a pretty inspiring lady. So FFI's role here is to work with the communities to strengthen their ability for fisheries management and crucially listen to their needs, their advice, and their desires for their future. A crucial part of this process and what makes the MPA meaningful is that these communities were involved in the design process. And I think that is a, one of the most crucial lessons learned here. They also raise awareness in their communities, conduct mangrove restoration, they help with the safe release of sea turtles caught in fishing nets. But most importantly, they actually engage in community patrols in their own fishing grounds. So far, 889 patrols have been conducted by these community fishery teams. And what this means is that there's active protection of their fishing grounds within the marine protected area. This is exciting, and they're even using a tool um, called SMART, the Spatial Monitoring and Reporting Tool, which is a way that they can track, improve, and adapt patrols to meet the needs and the changes that happen. 
So what does all of this lead to? What impacts can it have? Can it have and is it having any impact? So it is early days, but what we're finding is that the seagrasses that we're monitoring in the protected areas are increasing in coverage and extent. We're actually finding more seahorses than we did in our previous expeditions. And our coral reef monitoring is actually showing an increase in biomass of grouper, which is a key commercial fish species in Cambodia. We're also seeing an increase in reef fish abundance. This is early data, and we do need more evidence to track the impacts of this protected area, but it is due to the community who are providing that active protection and awareness to the community and their families. We're also taking a look at what's happening above the water too. So a recent perception survey that we conducted across all of the island communities actually showed the vast majority of people were aware of the protected area, and even more excitingly, 92% perceived benefits from the protected area to their villages. What they're reporting is that this is due to the increase in tourism, and very importantly, increased fish stocks. Now, this high level of awareness and this positive attitude would absolutely not be possible without the community leadership that is underway. So what we're seeing is that conservation works best when responsibility is actually in the hands of the local communities and when these communities have the support that they need. What we've been doing is supporting a community network. So all of these community fisheries can come together regularly every quarter to actually share their ideas, challenges, and successes in their fisheries management. And this community network is supported by what we call the Coastal Collective, which is a working group of local NGOs, uh, businesses, government, uh, and policymakers to support the fisher fishermen and the network that is in place. What this means is that there's actually a communication platform to enable collaboration. And really importantly, it provides a platform for the decision makers to listen and hear the needs and advice from the local community on the ground. So this is an exciting project, and it's actually catalyzing action across the coastline. What we're seeing is that the protected area in Korong on the left has actually catalyzed conservation and efforts north in the set of islands on the top left there, and is also excitingly just last month a second marine protected area, which used this one as a model, has been created in Cambodia. And we're also seeing that our approach to fisheries management has been requested to be something we feed into national policy, and we're able to provide our advice into national action plans to prevent and combat illegal fishing all across Cambodia's waters. So what's next? <clears throat> So these are the locations and the spread of the conservation that has been amplified across the coastline. So as our work has expanded, we will never shy away or move away from the focus, which is the communities. What we need to do next is ride this wave of enthusiasm that is being shown by the Cam Cambodian youth and the youth in the communities themselves to engage in conservation and engage in projects, enterprising projects, to reduce the amount of plastic waste in the ocean. A key part of this is continuing to, continuing to build the next generation of conservation researchers. So we'll continue to work with students like Kalyan from the master's course that FFI helped to set up in Cambodia to build that inspiration and make sure there are more C Cambodians and locals in the water taking this work forward. So I'll finish where I began in the small community of Praxvai on Koh Rong Island. This is the place that taught me that conservation is a social process, despite the fact that I came in originally just as a pure scientist. And biodiversity protection in Cambodia needs to have that community leadership 
This isn't just to be inclusive or idealistic. It's that effective conservation cannot be achieved without this meaningful local engagement. So from my team in Cambodia and myself, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne, for that excellent overview of the Cambodian work and how it's evolved in, in recent years to become so impactful. That's brilliant. And we'd like now to welcome our next speaker to the stage, and that's Lorna Slade. And, and Lorna is the executive director of a partner organization that FFI works with called the Mumbao Coastal Community Network. And FFI and Mumbao have been in close collaboration for a number of years to drive forward coastal community-led protection in Pemba Island in Tanzania. So. Thanks to Lorna for joining us from Tanzania, and we really look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Lorna, as you know, um, and I'm here to talk to you about the Pemba Channel Conservation Area also known as PECA, and I'll be calling it PECA through the, the slide so you know what I'm talking about, uh, a project that we've been working with uh, with FFI for the last three years. Um, <clears throat> I work for, I'm a director of a small NGO called Mambao Coastal Community Network, sorry about the mouthful, um, and we were established uh, eight years ago, Ali Thani there on the left, uh, second left, co-founded the organization with me. And um, our vision or our mission is to work with coastal communities and to promote their role in local management. Um, I'm trained in, as an ecologist. Um, I grew up in, in Kenya, and I've been working on uh, conservation in and out of East Africa for the last 25 years. Uh, this is our team. There's one key member that's, not miss that's missing there. Um, that's Harib on the left, Ali Thani, Ali Juma, uh, Danny, who's an intern, Fatima, myself, Hamida, and Ali Abdurrahim. Um, Pemba Island uh, lies on the east coast of Tanzania. It's the northernmost island of uh, Zanzibar. Uh, it's a special island because it's an oceanic island, which means that it was never joined to, or never joined to the uh, mainland. And it's separated from the mainland by a very deep channel of about 1,000 meters deep which means that there's a strong coastal current which uh, passes between it and the mainland and there's lots of upwelling of nutrients and there's a very rich fauna in that area. The PECA, or the Pemba Channel Conservation Area, is shown by the blue line in the middle there um, and embraces the whole western coast of Pemba, um, not unlike Scotland that we're going to hear about. The west coast is perhaps more interesting than the east coast. It's he very heavily indented. Um, unlike Scotland, perhaps, we have a lot of mangroves, coral reefs, um, seagrass beds, uh, sandbanks, and so on. Uh, the area at the bottom there um, in, in orange is the area that we've been working in. Um, the area is uh, important. There's very high diversity in uh, coral species uh, and fish species as well. And we have nine species of whales and dolphins, which is pretty unique for that area. Um, I just want to talk about conservation in people. I know that's the theme of this evening, but I, I, I just want to sort of reiter reiterate it because <clears throat> in the Zanzibar perspective, um, in the Pemba Channel uh, perspective, 85% of people living on the, the coast of Pemba are reliant on their marine resources. Every day they do something to do with the ocean. They're, I think. Um, we often perceive that people don't actually know the state of their resources, but actually they're very, aware, very well aware of the state of their resources. We often perceive also as conservationists that people are the problem, and indeed we are often the problem. However, when you're dealing with a situation where people are so dependent on the ocean, you have to involve them in decision making. Um, and you have to empower them to be able to take local management initiatives into their own hands. And this really forms the basis of our work. A uh, little bit about life in Pemba. This is an area of view, typical area of view. Um, fishermen will fish using uh, small canoes and uh, sailing boats. 
They'll use traps like this. Um, they'll use nets of all sorts. Um, they'll use spears, spear guns, uh, lines. Um, <clears throat> women um, do a lot of seaweed farming. This is important because it brings them an income. It's an export crop. Um, on the left of the channel there, you can see some lines of uh, down here. That's all seaweed farming. Um, women and children also uh, collect at low tide um, shellfish, um, octopus, squid, um, sea cucumbers, any, really anything that they can find. Um, and what's interesting is that people's lives are very much connected with the moon, the lunar cycle. Every uh, lunar cycle we have two um, periods of high tide, uh, spring tides, when, and, and when the, the tide is extreme. And this means that this is when people can access their resources. And in between those times, when people spend time at home, um, tending their crops, um, doing household chores, and so on. Dwindling resources in a lifetime. This is Hamisi, who's one of our community recorders. He's uh, measuring an octopus there that probably weighs about 500 grams. Um, I just want to read a quote from uh, an elder that I was interviewing recently. He said, I asked him about how the changes he'd seen in his lifetime. He said, octopus could be found up to 15 <coughs> kilograms. One octopus could feed 10 people. I once found an octopus so big that two of us could not pull it out of its den. These days, you're lucky if you find octopus of one or even 1.5 kilograms. Sea cucumbers are not seen anymore. Milk fish are scarce, butterfly fish and lobster have all diminished. So what has changed to bring this about? When you think about it, in our lifetimes, the last 50 years, almost everything has changed. Methods of fishing has changed, gears have changed, boats have changed, the number of fishes have changed. And there are other demands to this, tourism who are demanding, tourists come and they expect to eat seafood every day of their holiday, and not just one fish, they want an array of lobster and everything else. Um, and also there's a demand for, for export as well. Octopus is uh, exported from Pemba. Um, and reef fish, too, have been particularly affected by overfishing. So, yes, there are threats to biodiversity. Uh, another elder told me, people have become greedy. There is much destructive fishing, and particular use of small nets. Drag nets have destroyed seagrass and corals, and there is seawater rise because of mangrove cutting. Turtles used to nest on Quata Island, but not anymore. So, um, PECA covers 1,100 uh, square kilometers. Um, their resources, they have four rangers, one patrol boat, um, and two other members of staff. It's very difficult to address sustainable management over that area with those resources. So um, us as a, a project with FFI are taking very much a local approach, working village by village, identifying and mapping their local resources, <coughs> building their capacity and accountability um, with the Fisher Committee. This is Ali Thani here. Um, he's an excellent community facilitator, and he really gets people going, and they're, they're really um, inspiring. Um, and we help them to make bylaws to manage their area and to enforce those bylaws. This is a, a fishing committee on Kasiwa Panza. I want to talk a little bit about octopus. Octopus is uh, very special and gives us a, a really amazing opportunity to work for local management. Octopus, um, apart from being an export crop and having um, a, a monetary value, it grows very, very quickly. So it can double its size. Sorry, this is in Swahili, but I'm sure you can work it out. Miezi <laughs> um, means months at the top there. Um, it can double its size in six to eight weeks, um, and this means that if you manage to manage a, an area for octopus and close it for fishing, it means you can get really uh, high benefits in a short period of time. Uh, females um, have to be about one kilo or more to be mature to lay their eggs, and they lay their eggs on dens deep in the reef, and they um, aerate their eggs for a period of a month after which they die. Um, and the male dies too after mating only once. Not many people know that. Um, so, we've been working with communities to introduce what we're calling octopus banks. Um, and um, they've been working really well. Um, these are areas, as uh, Nicola showed in a previous slide, that two communities have set aside for three months at a time to close for octopus fishing. 
And so you can go from an average of a, an octopus of 500 grams before a closure to octopus of three to five kilos after a closure, or even one as big as this, which is about seven or eight kilos. This guy, uh, he was very pleased with himself when we gave him a prize. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, many communities um, fish octopus, and so it's, a, it's a, a fantastic entry point for us because it means that we can do something with communities quite quickly and they can see the benefit from their, from their work. It inspires belief in them, um, in, in themselves as well, to be able to do this. And I think that's part of the problem. People see the problem, but they don't know what to do about it. So we're capacitating them to, to be able to do that. We work in uh, one village called Kuku, and they really are star community. They set, it up, set, um, set up this, uh, the green area here is an octopus closure, and the idea was that every year they might close it for three months. Well, these guys decided that they would, they would close it for three months, they would open it only for three days, and then they would close it again. And they've been doing that for three years now, which is fantastic. But they've gone beyond that. The, the red area there, um, they decided then that they would set up a permanent closure, which would be for fish breeding, and they kept that permanently closed. And then beyond that, they decided that when they opened their area, they would uh, split the proceeds so that um, people would see a benefit. So they split the proceeds three ways, one for the community, which might be for something like a school or school doors or something like that, a third for the committee to cover the cost of patrol, and a third for the fishers who actually go out and fish on that day. So they've been really amazing. And this, this area here in the red line uh, shows the limit of their fishing ground and they're um, enforcing their bylaws within that area. This is a picture of the committee. Sorry that uh, people don't often smile when they have their pictures taken. But this is their um, uh, management plan. Um, and this is uh, setting up the protocol on opening day. So what next? Uh, we're working at the moment in three communities, um, and we hope over the next couple of years we'll expand that to six to eight communities, which would bring about 10,000 hectares of PECA into sustainable management. Um, ooh, what happened there? But meanwhile, we also recognize that people can't do this all by themselves. They need to be recognized by the authorities, they need to be supported by the authorities. So we also work with um, the Department of Fisheries um, and the PECA managers to support and acknowledge what communities are doing. But we also work with other players as well, which is really important. We work with the octopus buyers, the fish buyers, to make sure that people get a fair price for what they're doing. You know, if they're, they're putting themselves out there and uh, stopping fishing in an area, then they really need to be acknowledged for what they're doing. And this is a workshop where we have buyers and government and community members together to talk about that and to fix a price before opening. Um, well, thank you very much. I, I think that um, uh, Mwambao and FFI working together has been a really fruitful partnership. Us being on the ground, I think we can bring the networks, we can bring the local knowledge. FFI with a more global experience uh, really feed into that partnership really well as well. And um, while I feel, you know, by no means are we addressing all the problems that are facing people in PECA and their livelihoods, I do think that it's a very big step in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorna. That's a really great overview of the work. And I mean, the results from the octopus closures are so compelling and enticing that they're really helping to scale that kind of locally led conservation effort along coastlines. So it's, it's really inspiring. Um, moving to our last but not least speaker of the evening, I'd like to introduce Kerry Whiteside. Kerry is FFI's Marine Community Support Officer, who's based up in Scotland, and she's been with FFI for a number of years, uh, helping to really drive forward some exciting and innovative work with coastal communities along the Scottish coast. So thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the introduction. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so. I think we're all quite aware here that FFI is a little bit more accustomed to working in tropical seas than we are to working in our temperate British seas. 
So why today are we working in the slightly cooler, actually I can tell you really quite freezing waters of Scotland's coast? Well, while we have decades of experience advising others on how to look after the species and places that are special to them, we need to also apply that to our own backyard. After all, it is important that conservation starts at home. And also, Scotland's marine life is really fascinating. <laughs> So, what I'd like to touch upon tonight are the topics of why we're working in Scotland, why we're working with coastal communities for conservation gains, and how we're making a difference to the protection of Scotland's seas through this approach. So, you might be thinking yourselves, why Scotland? Um, let's think first about scale. So, if you look at this image on the left, you can see the extent of Scotland's crenulated coastline, 16 and a half thousand kilometres filled with locks, bays, skerries and inlets. Scotland is actually home to over 700 islands, 130 of which are inhabited. And our coastline equates to over two thirds of the entire UK coastline. So that's pretty impressive. This may well be the first image that comes to mind for you when you think of Scotland seas, maybe? <laughs> kind of wild, stormy, dreek, busy. And they are definitely a fairly wild and competitive space. But Scotland's seas are also intricate, colourful and delicate, filled with nursery beds of merle, which is a red coralline algae upon which loads of other species depend, seagrass beds, corals and microscopic scallops clinging to delicate red seaweeds and beds of brittle stars. Unfortunately, however, overfishing and dredging of the seabed, the very thing which all life here depends upon, is ruining this biodiversity. And you can see here the tracks of a scallop dredger and the devastation that it leaves behind after a few simple passes. We used to, in Scotland, have a diverse fishery for finfish, but overfishing with industrialised gear has caused key commercial species like cod and herring to collapse. And as Hugh was saying earlier, all that's left to fish for now at a commercial scale are invertebrates like scallops and prawns. And so dredging and trawling for these species continues apace. And it is the dredge and trawl fishermen who have dominated the debate around how we manage Scotland's seas, often at the expense of the marine environment. As a biodiversity organisation, we were of course very concerned about this current situation. So we set up our programme of work in Scotland in direct response to requests from coastal communities. They were wanting to broaden engagement in decision making and provide more sustainable solutions for Scotland seas. And a wide array of groups are concerned about the sustainability of their resources from small scale fishermen to local communities. In fact, this is Howard, who comes from one of the coastal communities that we work with in Scotland. And here he is explaining the decline in fin fish stocks in the Clyde, where he lives. So why work with communities to tackle this issue? Communities can make a difference. It is their knowledge, their coast, and their future. One example of a concerned community is the Community of Iron Seabed Trust, also known as COAST. They were set up in the 1990s by two local divers, and COAST went on to establish the first no-take zone in Scotland, and in fact, the only community-led no-take zone in the whole of the UK. And COAST aren't alone either. All across Scotland, communities are concerned about how their seas are managed and are poised to make a difference. So alongside COAST, FFI identified a number of different communities in 2014 who were wanting to take action, but they were constrained by access to resources, links to the right people, access to the right information. And we recognised that these were all things that FFI could provide. <clears throat> it's clear that communities taking a stand alone can bring about change for their local areas. But 
to offer alternative viewpoints to the wider debate around marine management, communities would need to come together under a joint banner and form a united voice. So working with COAST, we've been helping to build that voice. When we started in 2014, we were working with three specific communities, and today in 2018, we're working with 12. You can see here where they're distributed. So what does our approach in Scotland look like? Well, it's essentially three-pronged. So we're providing direct advice and support to enable groups to take action. So my, I work as a marine community support officer, and that basically means I get sent to far-flung areas of Scotland's coast, and I get to help groups prepare technical documents, could be for an MPA proposal, respond to government consultations, I help them get set up as groups or registered as charities, uh, I can help them organise meetings or facilitate meetings for them, provide advice on funding or staffing and so forth. All of it is basically determined by each individual community, so we don't impose our own agenda. It keeps me pretty busy, as you can imagine, and I've been really lucky to see loads of um, beautiful landscapes across Scotland and meet incredible people who are usually pretty eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also are sharing experiences and knowledge between the different groups, so pooling together their expertise means that they're less reliant upon me or even members of COAST to access that kind of advice. And we are building a network. So we want to build a self-functioning entity that can exist into the long term and represent the collective views of coastal communities across Scotland. So we're working with groups to make sure that that looks exactly how they want it to from the very beginning and functions as they want it to. But the big question with all of this, are we actually making a difference to the protection of Scotland's seas? Well, pictured here is Fair Isle, which is a remote island between Orkney and Shetland. And we've been working closely with the community here in their efforts to look after Fair Isle seas. So the islanders here have been campaigning for decades for protection of Fair Isle seas. Um, more recently, they submitted a proposal for a marine protected area. Um, in 2014, they kind of felt as though they'd hit a brick wall. And it was at that point that we were able to intervene. And we helped them rewrite the MPA proposal and bring on board new stakeholders. And finally, after decades of their own efforts, and with this help with this final push, the Fair Isle MPA was designated in late 2016. So this image here on the right um, is from a party that the island threw to celebrate the MPA, which I was really lucky to be part of. And it was great fun. It went on into the wee hours. There was music and speeches. But there was, interestingly, an MPA cake, <laughs> which was definitely a first for me. But actually, this is the island that produced a music album to campaign for their MPA. So they're quite creative. <laughs> and off the coast of Argyll as well, we've been working with local residents to help build up marine-focused organisations. And they've been working to engage their broader communities on the local MPAs that they have and their community's role within them. And with great success too. So this is an image from um, a local beach clean, the aftermath of a local beach clean. And this is actually a really impressive turnout for what's a very sparsely populated rural peninsula in Scotland. We're seeing wins elsewhere as well, where communities are organising their efforts. So in an area, an absolutely incredibly beautiful area off the northwest coast of Scotland, uh, known as the West Ross Marine Protected Area, we have actually seen a full ban on scallop dredging, heavily influenced by the coordinated efforts of a local community group there, who we've been supporting from their very beginning. So to share experiences and knowledge, we have been linking the groups up in learning exchange visits and through networking events. 
So this image is from a national workshop that we held, which brought all the different community groups that we work with together. So a lot of the groups would be in touch remotely, but because they cover such a wide geographic area, it's really difficult to meet up and have that face-to-face. -face. So um, for a lot of the groups, this was the first time that they had the chance to do that. And it's now enshrined as a popular biannual event. And we've also been building a vibrant communication hub in the form of the Coastal Communities Network. So for the website, we get about 2,500 hits per week. But more importantly, we've been facilitating through the website direct communication and information exchange between the groups. And it's actually the first public platform that these groups have had to come together through. What does this all actually mean? for marine biodiversity in Scotland? Well, <laughs> this group of people are now an informed, enthusiastic, and engaged movement for local marine conservation in Scotland. Between them, they've helped designate new marine protected areas. They've collected invaluable information on Scotland's marine biodiversity. They've challenged the government to improve its own protection mobilised others in their communities, and now they're gaining an effective voice in the debate around marine management in Scotland. And this can only bode well for the future of life in Scotland's seas. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their really excellent presentations. For, for me, it's so inspiring to be reconnected to those stories from the field, and particularly the sense of optimism that comes from that, that we you know, really can and that we are making a difference. Um, and just to wrap, help wrap things up tonight, I'd just like to make a, a few concluding remarks. And I think, for me, the, the key take-home messages that really resonate across those three presentations, but also resonate with the, our experience of supporting this work globally, um, come down to the fact that the genuine involvement and participation of people in the, marine, in the management of the marine spaces and resources that matter to them is absolutely critical to their success. Um, and being able to demonstrate that success is really important and, and the speakers have pointed out today that we are actually seeing evidence of improvements for species and for habitats. And certainly across our global marine programme we're amassing a huge raft of evidence to show that species are recovering, habitats are getting healthier, biodiversity is being protected uh, and this is um, you know, a great outcome. I think for me the fact that these approaches are bespoke to the local context and the specific challenges that people are facing, that's what makes it more relevant for people and makes them able to engage and support it. And certainly we see that there's just really high levels of support for the work in the countries where we're operating. We're increasingly approached for help to replicate approaches to new areas and so we see people wanting to do more and we're primed there ready to support and kind of help that work going forward. Um, and the last point I'll make is, is really that point about scale and influence and impact. It's locally led conservation efforts, but its impact goes much wider. And the ability uh, of this work to then give us a platform to influence at the national level where we can start to improve policies and practices as they relate to some of the more pervasive threats around industrial fishing, um, climate change, those kind of issues, that's, that's a really important platform. Um, as a final point, I'd just like to say a vote of thanks to, uh, to Arcadia and some of the other uh, supporters, many of whom are here tonight, for their investments into FFI's marine work and for helping uh, us to do this important marine work on the ground. So thank you to those. And back to Andrew to steer us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've got a few minutes, if you can just stand not getting a drink yet, for questions. Could I ask our speakers and you to come up here, and um, then you can see everybody. Um, <laughs> great.
So, um, fantastic presentations. Thank you all very much. And um, lots of common themes. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, I'll wait for the mic. Is that working? Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. Um, my name's Joanna Gordon Clark. And I'd like to ask if anybody has met with problems of microplastic pollution in doing the work that you're doing, which is splendid. Thank you. Microplastic pollution, who wants to kick off on that? Nick, do you want to yeah, sure. talk about that? Yeah, sure, I can take that? a stab at that. Um, I think it's fair to say that microplastics uh, in, are in every part of the world's oceans, from surface waters right down to the deepest, darkest trenches in the poles, in the Arctic. Um, so they're certainly a pervasive issue and they're everywhere. Um, and FFI was actually one of the first biodiversity organisations to flag microplastics as a, as a risk to biodiversity, given the concern that they're so small and easily ingested by a huge raft of, organi of organisms that they would be very quickly entering the food chain and, and on the menu for all. So we did a lot of work in the early days, this is back in 2009, to engage with the scientists to understand what the risks were, to talk to the companies who were producing products using these microplastics, um, with a specific focus on how we actually stop the direct sources of microplastics from getting into the ocean. Um, so this, sometimes these products are added to personal care products, toothpastes, face washes, that kind of thing. So we spoke to companies, helped them understand the implications, the risks for their sustainability um, profiles, and helped them to make commitments to phase out the use of those products. Uh, we also helped work with um, government agencies who are interested in this issue to um, prepare a world-leading ban in the UK, which came into force earlier in this year, which will see uh, microbeads uh, removed from all personal care products that flush down the drain. Um, and, you know, it's given us a platform to engage in the other sources of microplastics. So there's a range of different sources that come from the synthetic fibres that come off clothes and wash down washing machines um, as well as pellets, pre-production pellets that are lost through poor, poor practice. So it's certainly an issue on our radar. It's something that uh, you know we are, I think, leading the way on in terms of knowledge of the issue and actually getting traction on it. Um, and it's given us a platform to engage on a much wider set of activities around marine plastics, which present across all of our kind of international programmes. Great. Other questions? The lady over on the far side, a hand up. Um, as you pointed out, uh, we all like eating fish, and uh, you're, you're doing a wonderful job, all of you. Um, what I would like to know is, um, how do we encourage these local communities? Um, like, for example, in Cambodia, they're exporting fish. In, in Scotland, um, um, you have, uh, you know, you, you've got, you've, uh, all, the, all the, the, the fish are in the market. And, and how, how do we know um, that we are helping um, in, uh, preserving um, the fish that are in the ocean. Um, there are MSC um, uh, labels on fish, which I am very, very skeptical about, um, because they use they, their, the system, what I've read is their system is not kosher at all. Um, how, do we, how do we encourage these local communities. How do we um, put the uh, put the uh, the money into these local communities by buying the fish uh, they are protecting, so to speak? Good. Q, would you like to comment? Gosh, you've raised a, a can of worms. Some complicated issue there. Um, you know, c calling into question the the certification program. 
of the uh, MSC. You know, it's a, it's a valid thing to raise. It's a difficult issue, um, and I think that that's a conversation that we need to pursue in in various quarters. But at the same time, um, it's very important to have public engagement with the certification schemes that do exist. They may in certain areas be flawed, and I think there's a lot of work the MSC does that is very good, and there's some areas of the oceans that are contentious. And that is, but meanwhile, we can't walk away. We have to engage with those kind of processes. We can't walk away from them and just say, well, that's no good, because people do need signposts. They do need help. They do need to be able to trust certain, um, uh, certain labels as being meaningful. So I don't, want to th I don't think we should throw those things out. Um, I think the issue of how you engage locally um, to make sure that people... I mean, there, there, there are various ways in which the harvest of the oceans is, can be measured. But, I mean, one of the things we need to do, I, I think, across the board is embrace diversity uh, of the entire seafood choice. If we don't recognise that there are all kinds of species out there that can make up the, the fish and seafood diet, then we're in a lot of trouble. If we keep pounding away at the same most popular species, if everything has to be either tuna or salmon or prawns or cod, um, which I think those four species uh, are, are at one point made up over 80% of all the fish uh, consumed. Did I mention prawns? If you add that in, <laughs> certainly it gets it well over 80%. Um, we have to, as consumers, shop around and, and uh, try different things. I'd be very interested to know, uh, those of you working at the local level, what, what you think you can do to engage with the global issue of sourcing and certification. Well, I won't say anything about certification right now, but I was just going to add in around the kind of gear types. You, you can select certain products that you know were caught with certain types of gear. So, you know, creole caught prawns, for example, or hand-dyed scallops. And often, you know, the communities that we might be working with um, will be made up of scallop divers and creole fishers. So, you know, that's one way as well of engaging. And it's a very kind of sort of factionalised... It, it, it's Same. difficult that there's that the debate between the, the scallop dredgers and scallop divers, and I've known people who've been diving for scallops and who felt that they weren't getting enough support or recognition for fishing in such a clean way, and they've end up going back to the boats and, and dredging. So, to be a, it, it's vital that there are clear channels of communication. A lot of it, I think, there's a big responsibility on retailers to play their part here. I think that's massively important. Uh, to support clean fisheries, to support uh, sustainable fisheries, and to support the systems uh, where they're working. And pass that information on to their customers. It's absolutely vital. How does it look further away from the UK, Lorna, if you're um, in Pemba? Well, I think at, at a local level, um, very practically, we, as I mentioned in my uh, talk there, um, try to encourage a fair price at least and, and a better price price perhaps for those communities who are doing the right thing in terms of sustainable management and we've been uh, connecting with hotels as well to see whether they would actually give a better price and we have had some commitment with that as well I mean obviously that's a whole different kettle of fish if you like in terms of getting involved in that in, in that uh, business um, but I think also to bring the buyers and the exporters into the arena and to make them realize that it's in everybody's interest that sustainable fisheries or sustainable management happens and to to get them to acknowledge that it's important and to and to give that um, recognition where it's due through uh, better prices for those people who are doing the right thing Famously, people say in Asia, uh, particularly Southeast Asia, people will eat anything. So, you know, we're not down to four species, but <laughs> does that mean they eat everything um, in a sort of destructive way? Or, or do you find some discrimination along the lines that Lorna was describing? Um, well, I mean, in Cambodia, eating everything is, is definitely quite prominent on the, in the coastal communities we work with. Um, but in terms of making a difference on the local community level, 
um, with this type of the type of products that people eat and move, pass pass onwards for sale. I think because Cambodia is so far off any type of fisheries regulation, any kind of landing port management, the the impact starts at a very local scale, with just building that understanding of the types and sizes of crabs, for example, that people are bringing in. So a simple thing that we've been supporting in Cambodia is the concept of crab banks, similar in a similar way to the octopus fisheries. Under, an understanding within the communities that larger crabs can then reproduce and support the system, and sharing that knowledge with the community and encouraging these types of fisheries management processes at this very small scale, I think in a place like Cambodia, that's really the way forward. Is it, all, is it the case almost that the only tools you have for marine conservation are marine reserves in Cambodia because there's so little government um, support or restriction or policy even? Yes. Yeah, I think right now that's the case, but there is a huge... It's, a, it's kind of escalating the amount of effort the fisheries um, administration in Cambodia are putting in to fisheries regulation. What we're seeing is that, in fact, on the freshwater side, Cambodia has a lot of experience with... Uh, well, more experience with regulation and with controlling the types of fishing gear that are being used. But on the marine realm, which we're working in, it is very new. Um, but what we're seeing is that um, there are, for over the last two years, really, we've, been, we've had the opportunity to feed in to those management plans, feed in to the fisheries law on what type of gear should be used. Um, so there's definite, there's definite momentum building to get there. I'm conscious that we're going to get thrown out of here. I'm going to take one more question. And the gentleman there, right-hand side, had his hand up earlier. Um, our speakers will be joining us for drinks afterwards, so you will have time to, to buttonhole them. But uh, we can have this microphone coming to you, sir. What resources are involved, and would you like any more? <laughs> <laughs> well, what a great question. Yes, please. <laughs> The answer to the second part of that is definitely yes. <laughs> um, talk a bit about uh, the, the first. Sort of, Nick, do you want to sort of kick off across the piece and then we'll ask each of our regional representatives to, to talk in a bit more detail? Um, yeah, that's a, an interesting question to respond to. I think in, in terms of resources, the way that FFI works, we work in partnership um, to deliver all of our marine work, and that tends to be quite a, an intensive way to operate. We develop long-term partnerships with people, and we build, take the time to build the trust and make the connections and, and create those relationships. So we, we kind of commit to engaging in the countries that we work in for really long periods of time. And the kind of support that we provide evolves over that period, and it can be very different from the entry point, which might be helping an organization to become more effective, um, to, to the end point, which might be helping them step up to the policy arena and, and drive kind of larger scale impacts. So at any given point, the kind of resourcing that we need along that chain might change. But I think people are a, a key resource for us as an organization. Um, and we're lucky enough now to have marine technical um, support personnel across all of our four regional programs that we run uh, with specific marine technical staff leading our projects in country as well. So we're creating an entire web of marinis across the organization, which is quite impressive given this work really only started in earnest in 2010. So we have a great connected network and um, you know, we try to work with that sharing the learning across this community of practice to deliver our work on the ground. Um, second part, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Very quick one from each of you, Lorna. Um, yes, it's the second part, yes, please. But um, I'd just like to echo what uh, Nick said about FFI's long-term approach, because we all know when working with communities, things go forward, then they go backwards a little bit, then they go a bit more forward, and it takes a long time. It takes a long time. Investing in communities takes a very long time. Um, and so us as a partner, we really do appreciate FFI's approach and recognition that working in an area, you know, a one-year project really doesn't cut it. I mean, it might cut it for a few weeks, perhaps, but next year it might go back to how it was before. So you really need to be present for a long period of time and to 
continually support people, mentor people to, you know, when they fall down to help them pick themselves back up again and to start in new places. So, um, yes, long-term support is very welcome. Thank you. Marianne? Um, yes, so um, as I touched on briefly at the end of my presentation, there's a huge opportunity to um, invest in that palpable interest and enthusiasm within the Cambodian youth and the, in Cambodian students to get them involved in marine conservation. Cambodia has very limited capacity at its current stage to have Cambodian-led research, for example, or, for example, catch monitoring. But what I'd like to see is that FFIA pr provides a supporting role in getting more Cambodians in the water and getting more Cambodians enthused with marine conservation. Thank you. And Kerry? Yeah, I just reiterate, you know, about the human capital being so mm. important. And I think the nature of the project in Scotland, you know, with me as a marine community support officer, it's, it's founded in that and it's completely built on the relationships that we can build with the communities. I think that's our key resource. I'm going to give the last word to Hugh. Well, on the subject of resources, I just think it's amazing what you are doing with the resources you have. And everything you're doing seems to be so replicable and scalable that if you had more resources, I'm sure we would just see increasing successes of the kind we've been privileged to hear about tonight. So thank you all for coming and sharing that with us. And please, those of you in the room who are involved in providing the, the resources, can please continue to do so, because as you can see, the work that's being done with them is absolutely fantastic. Thank you well very said. much.